Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here. As always, we're grateful that you choose to spend your Thursday mornings with us diving into God's Word. And you are in for a treat this morning for our opening time. And uh, before I introduce our guest, I just want to say how great God is. He gave one of our children's teachers a word this summer, um, and it just so happens that it had something to do with the Lord's Prayer, which is part of our scripture lesson today. And Margaret was willing to share that with all of you this morning. So welcome with me, Margaret Kuharski. You may know her as the Purple Lambs teacher, if you have a Purple Lamb. You may recognize her as the chief buggy driver because she drives around those kiddos in that big buggy. But welcome with me, Margaret Kuharski. Okay, okay. Good morning. Will you pray with me? Father God, please calm my nerves. Allow me to speak clearly the words you have given me to share with these ladies. You are Jehovah Jireh. Help us to recognize and take advantage of your grace and your mercy, which are new every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we're all familiar with the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, and this morning I want to focus on verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. I doubt very much if Jesus was giving us the green light here to stock up and bulk up on carbs, but it got me thinking. On vacation this summer with my family, we were a party of nine, ages ranging from 88 down to seven, and in the mix we had three teenage boys. Now, as moms of boys are very familiar with the never-ending dietary needs of growing boys, where they feel the need to graze continuously throughout the day, well, mix that with the sparrow-like appetite of an octogenarian who was very set in her mealtime routines, and blend that all in with a continental way of dining very late in the day, and, well, I'm sure you can see where I'm going. So much so, the word hangry, a portmanteau of the words hungry and angry, became very common word in our vocabulary during the holiday. Hangry is a great way of describing the physical state of hunger that quickly escalates into so much more, affecting you both emotionally and mentally. Now, I may or may not be a person who has occasionally fallen victim to the effects of hunger a time or six, and in the interest of protecting the innocent, I shall only focus on how, through hindsight, I see how the phases of hunger affect me. One, distraction. This is how it starts. When I decide that whatever it is I'm currently doing is way more important than taking a break, so I ignore the signs, don't refuel my body, no biggie in the short term. Two, neglect. My body continues to grumble, but hey, I'm being productive and getting my to-do list done. I'll stop and eat in a bit. Three, meltdown. Without realizing it, I'm now tired and lethargic, more fuzzy brain than normal, and now I'm getting grouchy. Four, failure. I get frustrated with myself and have been known to snap at anyone who has the misfortune to be around me. Feelings of guilt then ensue, and my productivity is anything but productive, and I'm making silly mistakes. It's a bit like those candy bar adverts that were really popular for a time, that you're not you when you're hungry ones, when celebrities appear as hungry alter egos, until the effective person wolfs down a bite of delicious, gooey, chocolatey goodness. At this point, if I'm really lucky, I'll have a nourishing snack or a meal readily available to break the cycle, or if I'm unlucky, which is more often the case, I'll find myself snacking on a bowl or plate or a bag of something totally unhealthy which never satisfies my hunger. So, going back to Matthew 6:11, is it not the case that just as our bodies get physically hungry, our souls can just as easily get spiritually hungry our, without regular sustenance? Jesus told us to ask God for our daily bread, to humbly declare in our dependence to, on him, to provide whatever it is we need to sustain us from, from day to day. But that is not a license for us to sit back, focus on our desires, and wait for God to spoon feed us. Neither is our daily bread simply physical food. Bread is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible, referring to everything from the powerful symbol of God's provision for his people in Exodus when he rained down bread from heaven in the form of manna. To the Bible itself, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy 8.3. To Jesus himself, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. Being spiritually hangry, then, can also result 
in me not being me. That is, not being able to be all and do all God created me to be, because I'm not taking care of myself. Spiritual hunger for me then can be recognized with similar phases. One, distraction. I decide that whatever I'm doing is more important than, say, being in the Word, going to small group, being in prayer. No biggie in the short term. Two, neglect. I ignore the pangs and cravings that my spirit is making because, hey, I'm being productive over here, and I'll get around to do my Bible study in a bit. Three, meltdown. I start to feel disconnected, lethargic, guilty, should have gone to my small group. I start to fixate on past mistakes, on being worthless, and to cap it all, I'm getting grouchy as well. Four, failure. Well aware of my frustrations and my miserable attitude, I fear more guilt, I can find even more reasons to be envious and miserable, and so I withdraw and cease being productive in anything. At this point, if I'm so far gone, you can find me attacking the pan of brownies I made to take to the small group but I didn't go to, <laughs> but which will never be able to alleviate the cravings within me. But if I'm lucky, a worship song on the radio will remind me of where I need to go to find my sustenance, or I'll hear a great sermon, or I'll read a great devotion that just hits home, feeds my starving soul, and I'm once more willing, ready, and able to feast on God's word. The message tells us, Open your mouth and taste. Open your eyes and see how good God is. Blessed are you who run to him. Psalm 34, 8. Spending time with the Lord and being in his word is our soul food. And it's the only food that never leaves us empty, fills us up, yet leaves us wanting more. The great thing about this is that he promises to always draw near to us as we draw near to him. And it is then that you have the revelation that you can truly do all things through Christ who gives you strength. We were created to hunger after God more than anything the world offers. It's an uncommon choice, but an ability that God has baked into every heart. And it's an intentional decision we must choose daily. So, I need to place him at the top of my to-do list, not the bottom. Stop treating his life giving provision like leftovers. Relying on anything other than God to feed my soul and to keep me in an ordinary and common relationship with him. Preventing me from being all he created me to be preventing me from thriving and being a light for his kingdom. Why on earth then would I settle for the morsels the world has to offer instead of grazing on his word, embracing his power, strength, and wisdom? Come, all you are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, on your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. So, as human beings, daily sustenance is required. Regularly consuming proper doses of nutrients fuels our bodies to move and operate at maximum capacity. Equally vital is feeding on the Word of God. Regularly grazing on the Word of God moves us forward into becoming more like Christ, propelling us in the direction of fulfilling his plan for our lives. The more you eat, the more you will crave. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, 103. Whether you're full or hungry or hangry, it will be God's word that brings nourishment to you and is able to sustain and satisfy you. And as it turns out, it's so much easier to love well and live well on a full stomach. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was wonderful. What a great way to start the morning. You guys are dismissed to your core groups. Well, I'm going to just up front ask for grace. Show of hands, who saw the last strikeout? So you're as tired as I am. So I'm going to ask for grace. If I say the wrong thing, if I like mispronounce words, it's because I am exhausted, okay? They exhausted me last night, but it was well worth staying up. And then I couldn't go to sleep because my heart was racing. So we're all running on empty. So we'll um, talk about uh, this amazing chapter of Scripture. Then we all get to go home and take a nap, okay? Our children this morning, they have a great story. They are learning the truths um, of, of the Old Testament where Moses received the Ten Commandments. And so our kiddos are learning that these are rules that they need to learn to follow. It's an amazing lesson for them. Their memory verse is, I am with you always, Matthew 28, 20. And in keeping with our children's program, 
We're going to do a, a bit of elementary learning here. This, we're going to start slow since I'm tired this morning. And we're going to look at some opposites. Do we have these up on the screen? Yes. We don't, it's, we're, our brains are fried this morning, so we'll, we'll take it slow. Opposites, boy, girl. Go, stop. Big, small. Do I need to go on? Are, are we tracking? Are we, are we awake? Are we going? So I do these opposites to let you know this is kind of where we're going this morning. We're going with opposites as we look at the text today, okay? So we are smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is chapter 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew. And like we talked last week, this is not a sermon like you and I are familiar with sermons. We think of sermons, we come and the preacher's standing at a podium and he's speaking from some prepared notes. But that is not what Jesus was doing here. Remember, Jesus... The crowds were coming at him, and so he wanted to get away from the crowds a little bit. And so he goes up the hill, up the uh, mountainside, and his disciples follow him up there, right? And he's sitting, which is a posture for what the teachers, the rabbis would do. That's how they would teach. And he sat, and his disciples are gathered around him. And the crowds, yes, the crowds are coming to listen. But remember, like we talked last week, his primary audience is not the crowds, he is speaking and teaching his disciples. He has a lot to let them know. And as we looked last week, we saw that Jesus used a lot of antithesis statements or opposites, right? He said, this is what the Pharisees are telling you, but I'm telling you the opposite, okay? And this is truth. And so the Pharisees are doing, and they are living in a different reality from what Jesus is teaching. Jesus is dis teaching his disciples that kingdom living brings a whole new reality. As kingdom servants, the disciples, and we need to count ourselves among the disciples, we need to live a different kind of life than the rest of the world. We need to live 180 degrees different from the rest of the world. And so he's turning their thinking around, and I don't know about y'all, but he's turning my thinking around too as I continue studying this great book. He shows them how the new kingdom reality, this isn't about organized religion. The new kingdom reality is all about a relationship, a relationship with the Father. So I came up with a few of those antithesis statements um, contrasting the opposites of religion and relationship. So let's just go through these. One at a time. Um, I can't see where we are. There we are. Um, religion tells us, if I obey, God will accept me. But a relationship assures us that I'm accepted. That's why I obey. The next one, religion tells us if I'm good, God will love me. But a relationship assures us I'm a sinner and he loves me anyway. A religion tells us righteousness is all about what we do and what we don't do. But a relationship assures us that righteousness is all about what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. Religion produces pride and hypocrisy, where a relationship produces humility and sincerity. And finally, religion is motivated by fear, and a relationship is motivated by love. Jesus makes himself very, very clear this week. Religion, that is traditional religion, is empty and it's temporal. But the opposite of that is the new reality which he is introducing and it is kingdom living. And kingdom living is all about a relationship with the king, with our father in heaven. Jesus emphasizes this point so much, and this is where I got the theme here about relationship, is I don't know if you notice, you can go back in your Bible, chapter 6, he mentions the word father, your father, our father, 11 times. And when he says something 11 times in the course of one chapter, I think that's where he wants us to focus. So this is all about a relationship with our father. Jesus paints a picture of what a kingdom relationship with our heavenly father should look like. And we've got three points we're going to look at this morning. Um, my relationship with the father, it's going to require that I have a surrendered and sincere heart. Then we're going to look at an undivided commitment. And finally, we'll look at a complete trust. You don't have to write these down. 
they will come up on the screen as we keep going. So this morning, before we pray, I just want you to ask yourself, kind of get real honest with yourself this morning as I have this week in studying. Do you want a relationship with the Father, but you feel like maybe you're stuck in this vortex of religion where you feel like you're, you're trying to keep the law and check the box and look perfect so that everybody will see that you are doing the right thing? Do you feel like you're stuck there, but you still feel empty inside? Are you checking the boxes? Ladies, this morning, I want to let you know that religion is not the answer. Jesus teaches us that kingdom living is all about a relationship with the Father. So as we go through the lesson this morning, I challenge you, as he has challenged me, to check your relationship and see if there's any area of improvement that you need to work on. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures that you've given us. They are so powerful and so true. You want a relationship with us. And that is that blows me away that the God that created this universe wants a relationship with me and with each one of us here. Father, let us be women who pursue that and who desire that on every level of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so last week we had a ton of material to cover, and I rushed through, didn't get to some of it. This week, same thing. We've got a ton of material to go through. Um, I, what, I, I'm going to leave a lot on the cutting room floor here. What I don't get to, make sure you read your commentary because that will be covered there. But what, as we start here, we need to all understand that Jesus hasn't taken a week-long break. You and I have taken a week-long break since we looked at chapter 5. He didn't take a break. He is continuing his conversation and his teaching with the disciples, right? And he's teaching them about kingdom living. And he basically says, okay, hey guys, remember he's sitting there with his disciples. And he basically says, hey guys, whatever the Pharisees do, you need to do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, because they're not doing it right, okay? So you need to do opposite of what the world is doing. And he talks about three specific practices, giving, praying, and fasting. And he brilliantly shows his disciples the error of empty religion while simultaneously emphasizing the necessity of an eternal relationship with the Father. So the first bullet point, the first section we're going to look at, my relationship, and I hope you internalize this, my relationship with the Father is going to require my surrendered and sincere heart. And we're going to look at the first 18 verses that relate to that. Again, just like in chapter 5, Jesus is teaching that a new reality involves a sincere heart. This is all about a heart attitude. And the Pharisees didn't have surrendered hearts and their motives were not sincere. They practiced a works-oriented righteousness and that was separate from a relationship with the Father. So it was all about works and keeping the law and checking the box. And that was hypocrisy at its highest and Jesus wasn't going to have anything to do with it. So the first practice that Jesus addresses is giving. And this is not a tithe giving. This uh, Commentators say that this was over and above a tithe. This was a, an alms giving or a giving to the poor, giving to the needy. And the Jewish rabbis of the day taught that alms giving received a higher reward. Okay? So that's why they're making a big deal about this giving. So in the text, Jesus says, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet. Now, this is interesting. Commentary writers are kind of all over the place on this. But this can be, look, I'm giving, doo -doo -doo, or tooting your own horn is another way to say it. But I found it fascinating. I, I had several commentary writers concur on this. I never stand up here and say, well, I read this by one guy that was really out there. But several commentary writers concurred on this. They think maybe as you come into the temple, there would be collection baskets, uh, for lack of a better term, coffers to put your alms giving in, okay? But the, the, col the collection coffers for the alms were probably shaped like trumpets, and they're made out of metal, okay? And so the Pharisees would wait until big crowds are watching, and then they'd make sure they got people with their eyes on them, and they'd reach in their pocket and get some coins out, 
and throw it into the side so it makes a big old noise into the coffers. And so all the people will say, wow, he is so generous and so benevolent. And the Pharisees are like, yeah, look at me, I'm so righteous. And Jesus says, if you are doing this so that the people think you're benevolent and righteous, that's all the praise you're going to get because that's empty according to God. Because what in essence they're doing is saying, I want all the glory that should be going to the Lord, and so focus all that glory on me, and I'll take it from him. Ooh, that's a dangerous place to be. So the question comes up, is it wrong to give in public? Does all of our giving need to be anonymous? And Jesus, I think, answered that question. You talked about it in your core group. In chapter 5, he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. So he's saying, that, no, you need to let them see your good deeds. The difference, of course, is the motive, right? It's the heart behind the giving. When our public righteousness, when we do acts in public that are supposed to bring glory to the Lord, when we do them, like I was just talking with Tima, do we do them so that people see and recognize us? Or do we do them so that people will see and recognize him? We always need to make sure that people are seeing him through us. Great song, um, let them see you when I speak. Oh, that is my anthem song every week when I'm driving here. Let them see you when I speak. So, Jesus then moves on to the next righteous act of praying. And again, the hypocrites are example A of don't pray like that. <laughs> we need to pray in a, in a different manner. And so Jesus says, do the opposite of what the Pharisees are doing. Because it says in the scripture, it said they would stand on the street and pray. And the word street there means a very wide street where lots of people would gather. Okay, so maximum exposure. And this is where the Pharisees would stand out there. And, I, you know, you can just see them, right? You can see them, oh, Lord. Come be with us. And they're hoping that it's like a performance. And they're acting. They're putting on a show so that the people in the crowd will go, wow, he is so uber spiritual. And they're just praising the people. And that's what the Pharisees wanted. They wanted the praise. So is Jesus saying it's wrong to pray in public? Absolutely not. But I think what he is trying to tell us here is that it's wrong to pray in public if you are not in the habit of already praying in private. Okay, so we need to make sure we are praying in private before we go out and start praying in public. Prayer requires a surrendered and sincere heart, and Jesus is teaching that it is required to have a sincere heart in order to have a right relationship with the Father. And just one last thing on the prayer, it's, it talked about how the Gentiles, you read about that, offer up empty, um, repetitive verses. What he's talking about, a Gentile is just anyone that is not a Jew, right? And so the Gentiles had multiple gods. And so they would go to the first temple of God A, and they would just go on and on and on offering up prayers because their gods were very human-like, right? And so they would just keep going on and on with the prayer. Then they'd move to temple B and offer up the same repetitive prayer, just going, going, going. Then Temple C, and it just kept going on. So it's like they're throwing buckshot out there, hoping that something sticks to one of the gods, right? And Jesus said, that is just words. You're heaping up empty, repetitive prayers. So is it wrong to have repetitive prayers? I don't think so. Jesus prayed repetitive prayers. Paul prayed repetitive prayers. It come, becomes an empty, repetitive prayer when you're just saying words and it's not coming from the heart. And especially when it's not the will of God. We can fall into this trap, can't we? Sometimes we say grace and we're just going through the words. We're thinking about, oh, I'm so hungry. I hope the meatloaf turned out right. We're not even thinking about the words we're saying. Pray our prayers with our children at night. That can be a repetitive prayer if we're just saying the words. The Lord's Prayer can become a repetitive prayer if we're just going through the words. 
and I found it funny. We'll share some of these. Um, there were there's some people that admitted to just saying words and not really. They had learned the prayer wrong, and so they just said words, and it, it's, it's kind of funny. Do we have? Yeah, some people were saying, "Our Father in heaven, Howard be thy name." I thought God's name was Howard, apparently. Our Father who art in heaven, how'd you know my name? Someone admitted to saying, give us this day our jelly bread. They really didn't learn that one right. And this, this is the weirdest one of all that I read. Give us this steak and daily bread and forgive us of our mattresses. They, I don't, I don't know, they were really out in left field. And then lead us not in temptation, but deliver us some email. <laughs> Empty, meaningless words. Even if they are in the form of a prayer, empty, meaningless words ring hollow with our Father. And if we want to be in right relationship with him, then we have to have sincere, one-on-one -on -one prayer time. That's why Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And it may seem a bit ironic that just after saying, don't do repetitive prayers, he teaches them a prayer, right? Right? But there's a difference here. He is not asking them, he's not asking us to memorize and mindlessly recite some words. He never says in there, you have to say these exact words in this exact order. He said, read in your Bible, it says, pray like this. So this is a pattern for prayer. It is not a magical formula for prayer. Say these exact words and God will answer everything you want. No, there's, it's not a magic formula. It is from our heart, okay? Prayer always has to be from our heart. And this is almost sinful, y'all, due to time constraints. I'm going to skip over the entire Lord's Prayer. Oh, that's a sin, isn't it? Is that a sin? Y'all forgive me. I just can't get there. Your commentary does a great job addressing everything in there, so make sure you read that. We are going to move on uh, for time purposes to verses 14 and 15, talking about the forgiveness portion of that prayer, which is a sticking point for some of us. So verse 15 of Matthew 6, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Yikes, right? We read that and go, yikes. This verse has caused quite a bit of confusion, quite a bit of distress. It caused me quite a bit of distress when I misunderstood it, okay? So let me clarify. Jesus is not teaching here that our eternal destiny, our salvation is based on whether or not we forgive someone. That is not what he is teaching. Neither is he teaching that we can lose our salvation if we choose not to forgive someone, okay? That is contrary to everything the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches us that the only way that we are forgiven of our sins is when we come by faith and accept the grace that is extended to us, right? That is the only way we're saved, okay? It is not by what we do, who we forgive, or who we don't forgive. That is not how we are saved. So that is not what he's talking about. Nor is he saying, okay, if, if you are in a saving relationship with me, I'm gonna, if you don't forgive, I, you're, uh, we're done. I'm getting rid of you. Because scripture teaches us, we learned this last year, right? Uh, that when we are saved, when we are in that saving relationship with him, nothing, no one can take us out of his hand, okay? So Jesus is not referring to that initial act of salvation, that, remember we talked about last week, righteousness, that justification, that one-time saving knowledge of who he is, because that's a done deal. You're safe, you're secure, and no one's going to take you from him. What he is talking about is that day-to-day -day right fellowship with the Lord. And so if there is unforgiveness in our heart, it doesn't mean we're going to hell. If there's unforgiveness in our heart, it means that maybe you're wondering why God didn't hear in your prayers, why you feel distant from God. Maybe it's because there's unforgiveness in your heart. And he's saying, you need to get rid of that so we can be in back and right fellowship. I learned this the hard way, 
if you've been around, you know this story, but we've got a lot of new people, so I thought I'd share this morning. Um, when I was in college, I found out that my father was um, having an affair, and it shattered my mother, it uh, shattered our family, and it broke my heart. You see, my dad and I always had a great relationship growing up. We were two peas in a pod. I idolized him. And the problem when you idolize human beings, you put them on a pedestal, and when they fall, they break a lot of hearts, okay? So when I found out the initial days, I, I thought, you know, it's, he just needs a good talking to. If I go talk to him, we have such a good relationship, surely he'll see the error of his ways. And so I went to his office and I sat on the couch in his office and I cried, I screamed, I begged. And I saw in my dad that day something that I'd never seen before. I saw a very hard, unrepentant, unremorseful person. It wasn't my dad. And my heart was broken. And so was our relationship. Eventually, my mom and dad get divor got divorced and um, I think that as a, a result of the guilt and the shame that he felt, he spiraled into alcoholism. I was angry and I was extremely unforgiving um, to the point that for six years, I didn't speak a word to my father. He would try, he would call, he would send cards, I'd send them all back. I didn't want anything to do with him. Did not want a thing to do with him. And so that anger and that unforgiveness and that bitterness built up in my heart and y'all you think you think that it's just a you got it under control in your heart that my anger is just at my dad but let me tell you I know from experience it spills out into every little relationship you have okay and so after about seven years I was sitting in a Bible study, we're here sitting, and the teacher was standing up there, and she was teaching on Matthew chapter 6, 15. And she said, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And y'all, I will tell you, it, it hit me hard. And it, I'll be real honest, it wasn't like that light bulb moment where all of a sudden it was kumbaya and we were back into great relationship and I forgave him and it was easy. Absolutely not. I am stubborn. I get that from my father. And so it, I wasn't an easy case. God had his work cut out in dealing with me. But the more I pressed into him, the deeper I went with the Lord, the more I got into his word, the more I prayed, the more I realized that my heavenly father was desiring me, commanding me to forgive my earthly father. I'm happy to tell you that um, after many years of separation, my father and I did reconcile and we had a loving relationship before he passed several years ago and he was clean and sober the last few years of his life, which was a miracle. So, I know what I'm talking about when I say that forgiveness, that unforgiving spirit, it hurts you a lot more than it hurts that other person, okay? So, quickly, oh gosh, now we, oh, okay. Um, the third righteous practice is, was fasting. And Jesus says, when don't fast like the Pharisees. There was one day required for fasting. That was the Day of Atonement, okay? Um, the Pharisees would fast every Monday and Thursday. Of course, they go over the board, right? They're fasting every Monday and Thursday. And when you fast, you put ashes on your face so that everybody would know that you're sorrowful and mournful, okay? So they're walking around basically half of the week with ashes all over their face. Oh, I'm so hungry, but I'm doing it for the Lord. You know, and Jesus is, that's just real. I can see Jesus going, seriously? <laughs> no, he's probably not sarcastic. Um, <laughs> forgive me. Um, but I, Jesus says, why, that's why he says, wash your face. Get, it's not about what's on the outside. It's about what's on the inside. And so whether it's giving, praying, forgiving, or fasting, whatever we do, we need to do it with a surrendered and, sen and sincere heart. 
Quickly, moving on to the second thing. My relationship with the Father requires that we have an undivided commitment. And Jesus was well aware of the pull that money and stuff has on each one of our hearts. I'm sure he saw the lure of power and prestige. And he's warning against laying up all our treasures here on earth. And treasure can really represent anything that takes your focus. It's a divided heart. It's a distraction. It's like, oh, well, I know I should be doing this with my father, but mm, let's see if I can keep up with the Joneses. A, a laying up treasures can be anything. Money, power, popularity, making sure you live in the right zip code, drive the right car. Jesus is saying anything that you place before the father is going to enslave you. And it was going to require all of your time and all of your focus, and it's going to distract you from that relationship that he wants to have with us. So is there anything wrong with owning possessions? Absolutely not. Jesus never teaches that. What is wrong is when those possessions own you. Okay? So Jesus challenges his disciples, and he's challenging all of us to make sure our focus is on our relationship with the Lord first. And to lay up our treasure in heaven means that we are going to live the way God has called us to live every single day. That's a daily choice, to live the way he's called us to live. And finally, our third point, uh, relationship with, with the Father is going to require complete trust. And y'all, I wish I had another two hours because we're talking about worry here. And I think we women do this better than men. We worry, right? Anybody not a worrier in here? Okay, I'm... Prove my point. So we are worriers, right? And this, this is not a good thing. It is not a good thing to be a worrier. I, get, I, I said I was stubborn. I get that from my dad. I get my worrying from my mom. <laughs> so I am a hot mess, right? I, I, just, I am really messed up. But again, I'm worry and stubborn and I'm just a flawed person. But anyway, we could send days talking about worry because this is something that we all do and we all do it well. But Jesus is saying... Remember, we're talking about opposites. The opposite of worry is trust. And he's saying, I need you to trust me. It, it, there's a quote I read, and this is so interesting. It is interesting that we Christians can trust God for our eternal care, yet we won't trust him to meet our daily needs. Isn't that the truth? Jesus has just finished talking about it. when you are totally committed to me, when you are focused on me, he says, in the next verse, verse 25, therefore, don't worry. If you've got your focus on him, don't worry. Worry is a sin, and that's not fun for us to hear. We like to sugarcoat it, and we like to say, well, it's a burden. I'm fretting. I'm concerned. Worry is a sin because, as Paul says, whatever is not of faith is sin. And so, you know, it's not fun to say, but... When we worry, that's sinful. Worrying about things that we can't change the outcome of, it's wasteful. It's just, it, bring, it is not productive. It brings nothing to fruition, and it robs us of an opportunity. While we're stuck in our worry, we could be serving the Lord. We could be doing righteous acts, but we're stuck in our worry because we don't trust that he'll take care of things. Also, worry it can cause illness. We all, I don't have to tell you, uh, anxiety and stress issues are just overwhelming our society. Worry is a lack of faith because it tells the Lord, I don't really believe that you are who you say you are and that you will do what you say you will do. The old saying is true. We've got that saying, today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. <laughs> and it didn't do any good then. And it's not going to do any good today. So we need to heed what the scriptures are telling us to stop worrying. And what's the opposite? Trust. This morning's scriptures, as I saw them, Jesus is teaching his disciples and us a new reality. A reality that looks 180 degrees different from the world. A reality that has nothing to do with religion, but has everything to do with relationship. A relationship with the Father. Jesus paints a picture of what a kingdom relationship with our Heavenly Father will look like in the future and should look like and can look like today. 
a surrendered and sincere heart, an undivided commitment, and a complete trust. Is there some area of your relationship that might need a little attention today? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for showing us your truth and showing us that you want relationship with us. Father, let us be women who determine to have the relationship that you spelled out in this chapter today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry, I'm a little late.